we started the first superconducting circuits lab in India in back in 2012, so coming up on 10 years now. And uh, in the context of uh, the session here, one of the topics we have been working on uh, both here and also before joining here during my PhD in postdoc is actually working with uh, the so-called parametric amplifier devices. These are highly sensitive devices which can amplify at the quantum limit. And as some of you might know, these kind of devices are now actually being used in dark matter searches experiments. So what I'm gonna tell you today is a little bit about the work we are doing uh, in our lab. And then towards the end, uh, connect with some of the experiments that are being done in this area and then see how uh, one can create a community here to look at these kind of experiments uh, in the future. Okay, so um, I already mentioned this. Here is a bunch of uh, topics uh, on which we are working on. Apart from these parametric amplifiers, we do work on different kinds of novel qubits. The idea earlier on was to you know, reimagine what a qubit circuit could be. Uh, Vibor set a nice stage uh, in the previous talk of giving you different class of, uh, classes of qubit devices. Uh, and one of the, the qubits which he mentioned was just a simple uh, nonlinear oscillator. So we started reimagining that can, how can you build more complex circuits? So one of them is this idea of multimodal circuits where you have more than one modes of oscillation and each of those modes is nonlinear and hence can be used as an effective two level system and a qubit. And they create a unique kind of a three qubit system uh, for that. Uh, we are also working on uh, solving the connectivity problems. Like when you put down a network of qubits in an, uh, on a plane, you would like all of them to interact with each other on demand. So, but it's not so easy to do that. So how do you solve uh, that? We have some ideas working on that. Uh, and I'm also involved in some more uh, systems development kind of projects, sort of more engineering projects uh, with funding from DST and also from DRDO. Uh, and the most ambitious one is to actually put together a full seven qubit quantum computer. Uh, of course, you know, the world has gone uh, quite uh, far and IBM recently announced 433, but you know, this is still a big deal for us to put together actual system and see how to get these things to work uh, properly. So here's just a sample of these images. So this is the three qubit circuit, which we worked on. It's a novel qubit where the three qubit system, you can think of this as a coupled three qubit system. So it's sort of like an NMR molecule, except that we are doing experiments on one NMR molecule as opposed to an ensemble of NMR molecules, which is how experiments are done in NMR typically. A variation of this multimodal qubit is this device, which you have called Quantramon, where we have actually used one of the modes uh, which is coupled uh, as a measurement mode. Uh, like you saw in the previous talk also, there's a measurement cavity for these qubits. So this kind of coupling allows some advantages in terms of how you uh, efficiently you measure. So we're exploring some of those ideas over there. Uh, this is a fairly recent work, which I mentioned about connectivity, where we are putting qubits around the circumference of a circular transmission line. So this is a transmission line resonator sort of like with periodic boundary conditions. And what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to show that independent of where the qubits are located on the circumference, they can actually interact with each other. And it gives you a much more dense connect, densely connected network and that can have advantages as you scale up to larger processes. You want to create uh, connections with as many qubits as possible so that you can implement algorithms in less steps, as opposed to having to go through some intermediate uh, qubits in a, in a network. So, uh, and finally, this was actually one of the uh, earliest work we did uh, back in 2015, where we introduced a very simple microwave engineering technique to improve the performance of these parametric amplifiers. So for most of the talk, I'm gonna be explaining what these parametric amplifiers are, how they work, and then talk about what we did to improve them uh, their performance. <clears throat> so a very generic way of thinking about parametric amplification is to just consider some nonlinear medium, which is being um, uh, driven by two signals. One we call the pump signal, and this is actually a very strong signal, and it sort of sets up the nonlinear medium in the right regime of operation. And then you send in another signal, which is a much weaker signal, and this is a signal you're actually trying to amplify. And ideally, what should happen is that due to this nonlinear medium, these two signals interact. And that interaction creates an amplified copy of the signal, 
but it also creates this extra copy, which is called the idler copy, and that is required by the physics of this um, of the system. And the pump sort of more or less comes out undisturbed in the sense that even though the energy is being drawn from the pump for this amplification, and the energy has to come from somewhere, there is no other power source uh, in this uh, in this in this model. But the the magnitude of this pump signal is so much higher than the signal that we assume it's essentially not uh, changed. That's sort of an approximation one works with it. And depending on the nature of the nonlinearity, you can have two kinds of energy conserving processes uh, when it comes to these frequencies that one pump photon could break into one signal and one idler photon. So that could be one, which is called three wave mixing because there are three uh, photons involved. Or you could have a situation where two pump photons break up into one signal and one idler photon. And this is called four wave mixing. It really depends on what is the nonlinear system you have and, and how you set it up to depending on which these two processes uh, is, being, is being used, okay? Now in the superconducting qubit domain, we have this fantastic element, this building block called the Josephson junction, which is basically a superconducting tunnel junction. So it's two layers of superconductor separated by a thin insulating barrier through which electrons, or in this case, Cooper pairs can tunnel through. And this tunnel junction is represented by this symbol, which is a cross. And electrically, it behaves like an inductor. So the Josephson relations, which you know Brian Josephson wrote down uh, to explain the electrical properties of this, tells you that the current through this device, which is the supercurrent, so a current without any dissipation, is proportional to the sign of this quantity called delta. And delta can be thought of in multiple ways, but the second equation actually is a good definition of delta. It's sort of the integral of the voltage. So in some sense, it's like the flux in an inductor, you know, with some constants in the, in the front. And from these two equations, you can sort of compare this to how voltage and currents are related in inductor you can get an effective expression for what the inductance of this device is. And you see that that depends on the amount of excitation present in the system. So it depends on delta, which means it depends on the current flowing through the system. So that's why it's a nonlinear inductor. And by putting two of these junctions in a loop like this, you can now make a flux tunable, nonlinear, non-dissipative inductor. So a magnetic flux now allows you to change the value of this inductance. The inductance is already nonlinear. And if you look at these equations, there is no dissipative term present here. Now, of course, this is an idealized representation. In principle, the dielectric could have dissipative uh, processes going on, which can cause some dissipation, or your superconductor could still have some unpaired electrons, which can give rise to dissipative transport. But in the ideal case, this is a perfectly non-dissipative inductor. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is that typically when you think in optical systems, nonlinear systems come associated with a lot of dissipation. And dissipation is usually bad when you want to um, amplify, build an amplifier, which is basically an uncontrolled degree of freedom. So, th so this is basically the ba uh, element. And so how does parametric amplification uh, work? One very simple model is actually that of a fabry perot cavity, like shown here, where one mirror is being modulated at twice the frequent, natural frequency of resonance, okay? This kind of uh, uh, modulation is called a parametric modulation. And if you do that, then one can show that any signal which is coming close to the resonant frequency of the cavity while this pump is on, it reflects back from this system with gain. So it absorbs energy from this pump tone. And so this will be a three wave mixing process. And this can be implemented in the circuit form with the help of uh, a squid, the one I showed you earlier, because it's a tunable inductor. So it creates sort of a tunable boundary condition for this Fabry Perot cavity on chip. So this is nothing but a section of transmission line. Uh, at microwave frequencies with two boundary conditions. One is a weak capacitor, so it's like a partially transmitting mirror. And another one is a variable inductor. So by passing an AC flux through this loop, I can create uh, this modulation, which is equal to this picture. And then I can bounce off signals from, from this uh, port here and get amplification. And people have used this kind of uh, ideas to build these parametric amplifiers. The system I will tell you in more, a little bit more detail about is actually just a driven nonlinear oscillator. And in fact, this is basic duffing oscillator physics. Uh, 
when I was first looking at this uh, during my PhD days in, you know, in the early 2000s, I found that this is discussed in Landau and Lifshitz mechanics books like in the 50s. So it's very old physics. It's just, it has become a lot more relevant um, in today's terms. So such a nonlinear oscillator, a duffing-like oscillator, has a response. So this is oscillation amplitude versus frequency for different driving strengths. So for very low driving strength, it just looks like a simple harmonic oscillator, has a Lorentzian kind of response, has a peak at the resonant frequency and then, and, and then decays on both sides. But as you increase the amplitude, especially at sufficiently large amplitude, you actually get these multi-valued solutions. So there are two stable states which are possible, one high one and one low one. And this just comes simply by looking at this driven nonlinear oscillator problem. But very close to the point where the system is about to get bistable, but not yet, is where the interesting stuff happens in the context of parametric amplification. The lower is just the same data, but plotted in terms of oscillation phase uh, of this oscillator. Okay, so this is just simple classical driven nonlinear oscillator. So if you look at this now, treat this as a duffing oscillator term. So this is now a duffing oscillator driven by a harmonic drive. So we look for steady state solutions of this, just like we do for harmonic oscillator at the same frequency. And then you can say that, okay, I'm going to have some solution, which is going to be at the same frequency at the drive with some amplitude and phase. I now say that I'm going to add a second drive. So this is now playing the role of the pump. The second drive is much, much weaker. And I'm going to basically say that I'm going to look for a perturbation kind of solution on top of this, where I say that the new solution is the old one with a small extra increment, with the condition that the drive for the second signal is much, much weaker than the first one, which consequently means that the value of Y, this extra oscillations we are going to get is going to be much smaller than the original uh, steady state oscillation, which the pump set up. So if you now do this and solve the equations, you get an effective equation for this Y variable, which is the perturbing term. And this looks like, if you now look at it, it has a second order term, a first order term, uh, and um, a linear term here. There's something complicated in front, but otherwise it looks like a harmonic oscillator equation, which is driven by some signal, a weak signal over there. But it's this term here, if you look carefully, there is an overall coefficient, which is like the frequency square. But this is multiplied by a time varying uh, uh, term, which is proportional to twice the original pump frequency. So you see that now this driving term is close to double the natural frequency of this oscillator, but it's not exactly double. So that is a detail. So what I basically tried to show here is that a driven nonlinear oscillator effectively looks like a parametrically modulated harmonic oscillator. Okay, I've put harmonic here in quotes is because this equation is expanded for small values of y. Okay, so there are nonlinear terms, but we can ignore them for the lowest order solutions. Okay. And the pump is not exactly twice the effective resonant frequency because omega p is not equal to omega zero effective. So it's not exactly, so we called it, a, we call it the detuned pump system. It has some practical consideration, doesn't change the basic physics. And the pumping strength, this, this k, is related to the original uh, solution, steady state solution, which is X. Okay, So that's just the detail. So once you have that, then you have exactly the same system as before. So this system will also amplify signals which are sent to the uh, cavity. Basically, it will amplify this signal omega S. So in practice, how does one use this? So this is actually the, the setup. You have your nonlinear oscillator here. You can have a flux input, but here the flux input's job is to only tune the resonant frequency to the desired value because that sets the band of operation. Then you have this microwave device called a circulator, which is a three port device. And it only allows signals to propagate in the direction shown here. So an input signal from here, which is a pump, goes and biases up and it reflects back and comes out at the output. You send your weak signal that also goes, now combines with this pump signal, interacts in a nonlinear way, comes back out, gets amplified and you get an amplified copy. And as I said, you also now get this idler copy and this is a four photon process. So the idler is exactly at two omega pump minus omega signal. So it's equally spaced on the other side of the, of the pump. And the point here, the important point here is that this picture actually tells you why this amplifier 
works at this very low noise limit. Okay, where is the noise coming from? So far, I, this is a completely noise-free system. I'm just talking about waves propagating in and out. In the ideal picture, if this is cooled down to low temperatures, you can say that the only fluctuations which are present are actually zero point fluctuations corresponding to those frequency. So one simple model is that you assume, okay, the, the signal brings with it some noise, which is zero point fluctuations. That gets amplified by the same amount because this nonlinear system, which is just scattering these waves, cannot distinguish between signal or noise. It's just whatever comes in, it will just amplify it. But because there is going to be noise coming in from this other mirror frequency, which you cannot turn off in this case, that remixes into, because so in, initially signal was going from here to there and also cross like this, but now the noise from this side is going to mix into your signal band. And since these frequencies are all close to each other, their intensities of noise are also similar. So essentially what happens is that you get double the noise of what you started with. So if originally your signal to noise ratio had some value, now your signal to noise ratio is a factor of two smaller with the difference that both signal and noise are about 100 times bigger. And that's really the purpose of an amplifier. So this is the quantum limit that the best amplifiers can double the noise. And when you are at low enough temperatures, it will add only half a photon of noise corresponding to the zero point fluctuations. And because these systems are very clean, they don't have any additional sources of dissipation, et cetera, you are able to build these devices and get them to operate very close to the system. If I don't do a good job of ensuring that unwanted noise is not entering the system, then I'm good. Otherwise, if I have some extra noise, if I don't do a good job of filtering everything, then that noise will also get amplified. But you can do this nicely in these systems. Okay. So this is a has a flux tunable band. It's a lumped element design. This is sort of work uh, I did during my postdoctoral days now, uh, some time back. And it allows you to gain, get a gain of more than 20 dB, has a bandwidth typically about 10 to 50 megahertz or so, and you can get quantum limited operation. Okay. And there are many, many applications of these kind of devices. Uh, one of the early experiments uh, we, uh, which I was involved in was actually to use this to detect the quantum state of a superconducting qubit in real time. What you're seeing here are real time decay events of the qubit decaying from the excited state to the ground state. This was not possible before parametric amplifiers came on the scene. And now they are routinely part of all superconducting exp uh, qubit experiments and definitely all superconducting quantum computers because you need to make these measurements fast and with high fidelity. You can also do things like quantum feedback where you can stabilize the state from decaying because of this access to this very high quality measurement signal you have with them. And this also allows you to look at these systems in this so-called weak quantum measurement regime. And you can see how quantum trajectories evolve in the presence of measurement. So sort of demystifying the whole quantum collapse picture to some extent. And these nonlinear parametric systems are also a great source for microwave squeezed light which has its own applications in many. And this is just a very small sample and there are many, many things uh, one can do with this. One of the other things is that the same device can actually be used as a very sensitive sensor of magnetic field. Why? Because the squid inductance depends on magnetic field. So any small changes in the magnetic field here will cause small changes in the resonant frequency. And that can be detected by shining a microwave light and looking at the phase shift of that microwave signal. But if you use the fact that this is a nonlinear oscillator and you bias it up, so you use a strong enough drive to bias it up to this nonlinear regime where this parametric amplification also kicks in, it gives you an inbuilt amplifier to the system. So not only you have a, a transducer which converts change small changes in magnetic fields to changes in microwave uh, signal phase, it also amplifies that signal and allows you to make an in, in a, a detector which is very, very sensitive to give you good uh, flux sensitivity. And as Vibor was saying, it, this is only limited to how you couple to this uh, resident circuits uh, parameters. You can have a mechanical system which could couple and modulate the frequency, the same thing would work. So it really opens up many and you'll see some more uh, in just a little bit. So uh, at that time, we were also looking at, so this is again worked from during my postdoctoral days, but these are all systems which we can make in our lab now very easily. We were also looking at these different kinds of 
uh, squids made using very narrow constrictions of superconducting material. So this, this is not a Josephson tunnel junction, but it's called a nano bridge junction or a micro bridge junction, but it has the same uh, equations and works very similarly. And the advantage of having this very narrow, which is usually like a few tens of nanometer wide, is that you can now put magnetic molecules very close to them and study their properties. At least that was the, the hope behind developing these kind of experiments. The early generation of experiments were using uh, low frequency DC techniques to detect the state of this qubit and how it gets affected. They were slow, they, were, they caused a lot of noise. So these new techniques of using high frequency microwave, and again, because this is a nonlinear system, you can bias it up and get parametric amplification as well. And that was shown uh, in this paper uh, many years back. Okay, so coming to now things which we have been doing in our lab itself. So um, one of the things I mentioned was actually we were able to improve the bandwidth of these oscillators with a very simple microwave engineering trick. Now, the reason the bandwidth is constrained for amplification is that this oscillator is a finite quality factor oscillator, which means that it only responds to signals very close to its resonant frequency. So that's one uh, starting point itself gives you a, a constraint. But when you actually bias it up to this special point where you get gain, it actually slows down the dynamics and reduces the bandwidth even further. In fact, there's something called a gain bandwidth uh, product, which you have to conserve. If you increase the gain, the bandwidth reduces. So we found a way to work around it by introducing just one simple extra reactive element. So this is again your nonlinear oscillator, the squid and the capacitor, and it's coupled to the environment, which is basically your uh, transmission line. And we just introduced one very simple thing, and it sort of allowed us to cancel the reactance of the circuit and allowed signals outside of that usual band to get in. And with that, we were able to, and that's sort of the device. So all the extra part is in the circuit board here. This chip remained exactly the same. Now this idea has been adopted by many different groups around the world, and they're using various versions of this with integrating the transformers into the chip itself and many other variants of that. And we showed that from devices which usually give 10 to 50 megahertz of bandwidth, we were able to go all the way up to 600 megahertz of bandwidth without compromising on the noise. So the noise remained at quantum limited and also sufficient power before it starts to saturate. This is one of the drawbacks of these systems is that because I've ignored those higher nonlinear terms, they will actually start to saturate. The gain doesn't keep uh, maintain itself if you send in a very strong signal to be amplified. But that's okay because in most applications, the signals it's trying to amplify are very weak, okay? So uh, this was uh, something we did a while back. And very recently, in fact, this paper just came out a few weeks back, we built this nonlinear oscillator using a different type of a Josephson junction. Now, this was in collaboration with Professor Mandar Deshmukh Skup at TIFR, who's an expert at making these kind of graphene-based devices. So instead of, a, again, a superconducting insulator, superconductor tunnel junction, this one uses a graphene as the tunneling barrier. And we use two different superconductors to connect them. But again, the physics is the same. It's a nonlinear inductor. Its nonlinearity is slightly different, but otherwise it's remained the same. So we are able to make this device. And one of the big uh, questions with graphene-based tunnel junctions is that graphene in this context behaves like a normal metal. So it's an SNS junction. So there was always a question of, is it going to be dissipative? It is in some regimes and it has less dissipation in other regimes. So in this, in this experiment, we're able to show that the dissipation is small enough that we can actually use it to build again, the same parametric amplifier with this added advantage that now a, a DC gate voltage as opposed to a magnetic flux can tune the resonant frequency of this because you can now dope the graphene with the help of an electric field. And this opens up a new way of controlling these devices. And that's really uh, can be handy. So here, what we are showing is that the resonant frequency, which is this white line here, tunes with gate voltage over this uh, range of about 10 to 15 volts. Okay, and then by choosing an, uh, an appropriate point here, we were able to show that you can get parametric gain. This one did not have the, the bandwidth engineering, so it only had the standard 10 megahertz of bandwidth, but the noise was again very close to the quantum limit, which is set by this green uh, dashed line. So. The advantage of this kind of device is that it has first this gate voltage tunability. Because we use graphene and uh, superconductors with high t higher T's values of TC, 
this can operate under a larger magnetic field. So Weber had mentioned that superconductors don't like magnetic fields, and especially most of the devices we use are made out of aluminum, which cannot tolerate uh, a lot of field. Here, we should be able to put much more field that opens up possibilities of doing these experiments in different conditions. And finally, it opens up uh, the possibility of building new types of quantum sensors and bolometers, because why now you have a graphene sheet there. So anything which affects the graphene, any kind of signal which can affect the graphene, it could be an incident photon, it could be something else, will now affect the property of the resonator and consequently can be detected. And you can take advantage of all the same techniques, uh, which I mentioned in the last uh, few slides. Okay, so this, this is very recent work and it was published in uh, Nature Nano just a few weeks back. And now we are building up on doing follow-up experiments to look at uh, other sensors. Okay, so coming towards the end of my talk, um, I'm flashing here some recent uh, archive papers where some of these techniques have been used for dark matter search. So here's an example of an experiment where they did a dark matter axion search using what is called the Josephson traveling wave parametric amplifier. Now this device is something I have not discussed here at all. The difference is, is that instead of making a nonlinear resonator, which has a finite bandwidth, as I was just explaining to you how that constrains the operation frequencies and the band of signals it can amplify, you can actually make a nonlinear transmission line which is sort of analog of a nonlinear fiber in optics. And then the same physics applies, but now you are less constrained by the natural bandwidth of this, even though it's not like an infinite band thing, because once you set up the, the, the transmission line with the pump tone, it introduces dispersion in the system and that restricts the bandwidth. So people have been working and improving by doing all kinds of dispersion engineering. So going from, 10 to 50 megahertz to about 600 megahertz using our simple technique to a nonlinear transmission line where you can get gigahertz of bandwidth. So this was the thing they've highlighted that the ability of this Josephson traveling wave amplifier to deliver high gain over a wide three gigahertz bandwidth has engendered interest from those aiming to perform broadband axion searches. Of course, this is just one part of the whole setup. There is a whole experiment there on what this traveling wave amplifier is actually amplifying. Similarly, there was another one uh, recently about using uh, near quantum noise uh, limited uh, detectors for dark matter search. So this one again uses uh, what's called uh, a phase insensitive JPA. JPA stands for Josephson parametric amplifier. And that allows them to improve the, both the signal to noise ratio and the speed with which data is acquired. And um, this has been done uh, very recently. So, Personally, I have been following some of these very peripherally. I have not gotten into doing these kind of experiments yet, but the tools for uh, developing these amplifiers we have uh, in our capability in our lab in, and also in other groups around the country. So my interest is that I would be, I would like to develop new detectors if a particular experiment says that we need this kind of a detector with these capabilities, that would be uh, an area of research to work in. Uh, also get involved in these kind of dark matter search experiments and other uh, experiments which require sensitive detection. But currently what is missing and what we need, sort of especially in the Indian context since this session is sort of about that, is that we also need other scientists who can design the experiments, right? As I said, the traveling wave amplifier is just one element of a whole experiment which already existed. So we need people who can design and work on those experiments. We also know to create links with the international experiments where we can contribute with our uh, own expertise. So I'll uh, stop there and take any questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Vijay. So is Michael here sitting somewhere? Michael Doser? Hi, Michael. So you're getting an idea of what kind of capabilities there are, um, TIFR and here in Bangalore. So you hear some more after the break. So let's take a couple of questions before you go for a coffee break. Anybody have any questions? There, Michael, yeah. Yeah, one of the questions we have, of course, with the bigger experiments is scaling up um, from one to many, and many is many, many. How do you see that path? Uh, you're talking about how to build many, many superconducting sensors? Or how to combine yeah. many sensors in a single readout system. I mean, this is exactly the question. So this, uh, I mean, I have 
so far not worked on these aspects but this is not very complicated or non standard in fact this has been done in the context of m kids you know these microwave kinetic inductance detectors and there they need a multi channel uh, uh, sensor anyway and then each of those uh, channels can have either their own amplifiers or they can all be multiplexed if they are you know frequency multiplex and then you send it to a broadband system this is actually a very similar challenge to superconducting qubit readout in in the in when you're building a quantum processor with you know 400 qubits are you going to have 400 amplifiers or are you going to have five amplifiers which will you know each do 80 each or something like that so i mean these are i think engineering challenges and when posed can be solved i mean they're not easy but i think they're not there's nothing fundamentally preventing uh, one from doing the fundamental issue will come if the original experiment, which is actually the, the front end, you know, the, the receiver, which is detecting either dark matter or gravitational waves, if the operating conditions of that are incompatible with the operating conditions of a superconducting sensor. So say very high magnetic field or very high temperatures, uh, then there could be an issue. But again, you know, these experiments I mentioned have shown that at least in some cases, it is possible to uh, make them compatible. And one can look at at least Going from, you know, the experiments I showed are all dilution refrigerator experiments, 10 millikelvin. Um, in principle, one could push it to uh, 4 Kelvin liquid helium kind of operation. The noise might be a little bit worse, but there are probably uh, tricks one can play there as well. And there's, so there's scope for innovation over there. Currently, these amplifiers basically, whatever temperature they are operating at, that's what set the noise. Yeah. But, but you have put the finger on the right. I mean, I have been. So I mean, Apurva has challenged me with the same question. How do you add so many sensors into a coherent array so they can act together as a large sensor? It's a big, it is going to be a big challenge for us. It is, and we'll talk about that maybe on Friday. So, I mean, I would add a comment that it is, I can imagine that it's easier than easier to put thousands of amplifiers of this type than thousands of qubits. <laughs> we'll, we'll put you to test for that. <laughs> Okay, another question before we move. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, somewhere uh, in the middle of your talk, uh, you put an uh, put an impedance element in a circuit and you increase the bandwidth. Yeah. Uh, can you just? Um, I mean, I didn't quite catch. Yeah, there. Uh, the, yeah. 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 So, how did this actually work? So basically, the element we use here is a simple linear LC circuit which is practically implemented as a lambda by two transformer, but that's just the technical detail. But a linear LC circuit, which is exactly resonant with this pump frequency, sort of cancels the capacitive roll off of this, uh, this original oscillator. Okay. This was actually a accidental discovery we did by when we were playing around with the uh, simulating these, these circuits. So then, you know, we worked with some theorists to figure out, okay, this is, one can explain this from, from analytics as well. Yeah, um, that's neat. That yeah. part has actually been known uh, in other fields in a different context as well, where one tries to pump in energy into resonance systems, but you want to, uh, so you use the resonance system to enhance the quality factor so that you can get a current amplification, but then you lose bandwidth. So you can introduce more modes. So it's it's some kind of uh, a, you know band pass filter, if you like, where so sort of going from some very narrow band thing, you you make it flat, and make the roll off a little bit different. So it's a very simple microwave engineering trick applied to this specific case. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>